Good morning, Howard Avenue Christian Church. Can we stand and sing together? Love that was foretold. Love that was foretold when the prophets spoke of one to come. Heaven came for us, reconciling hearts to you, our God. when they said to me, let us come to the house of the Lord to worship our God. It's good that we are gathered here as a people of faith to lift up our hearts, minds, and voices to God. Welcome to worship at Harvard Avenue Christian Church. For those of you online, a welcome to you as well. Please take note of the links below the worship cast. For those of you here in this space, we hope you found your way to one of our bulletins as well as the elements for communion that we will partake of later in this service. Now let us continue to praise our God. Right now, anything can happen. Right here, everything can change. It is time, cast all your cares upon him, right here, right now, no fear, don't 
old friend just run into his presence just know he's got every single tear be cleansed in the holy name of jesus right here right now no fear just
we come to a time of prayer today, you have received an email with our congregational prayer concerns and news for this week. We are always so grateful for the ways that you share on those connection cards or by email and phone calls through the week so that we can be in prayer with you and for you. Our pastoral prayer today focuses particularly on education, on our students of all ages and our educators and administrators. We are mostly back to school in all of our various locations and ways, and we are so prayerful for the year that is ahead. So as I move us through a time of prayer for our students in two age groups and for our educators, I hope that you will think of particular names and faces to attach to those prayers so that we might be most focused on the needs of our whole community. Will you join me? Creator God, creating in us always, we come to you with gratitude, with deep thanksgiving for all that you have done and will do in each of us. We pray this morning for our children, for daycare and preschool, for kindergarten and elementary. When they are here together on Sunday mornings, they learn about the fruit of the Spirit, the ways that we show to others what God looks like. It's part of why we call our children's ministries the orchard. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May each child remember that they are God's child. They are loved by Christ and strong in the Lord, knowing that their church friends are proud of them and that we pray for them always. Gracious God, we pray blessing on these children for their health and safety, for their learning and growth, for their friends and fun. Remind them that they are smart, strong, and loved. Gracious God, we pray for our middle school and high school youth and for our college students. The world is bigger and different and more exciting and challenging the older you get. And as we move through these school years, more things pull at us to tell us what's important. May these students remember who they are and whose they are. May they remember they're created by a loving God, given a mind and a heart and abilities to love others. Gracious God, we pray blessing on our youth and college students for energy and adventure, for learning and discovery, for confidence and wonder. We pray that you would cover them with your grace and love always. Merciful God, we pray for our educators. They are teachers and assistants, principals and administrators, tutors and mentors, storytellers and shepherds. They bring their very best and truest gifts every day and we entrust them with our greatest gifts too. They face tremendous challenge and exceeding joy. They take pride in their work and in each student's uniqueness. May they always know your love, God, surrounding them, going before them and behind. And most of all, may they rest confident that you have placed within them everything they already need to accomplish all that their year will require. We pray and pledge our support in every way we can, at every level we can. We are grateful for them and send them into their year strengthened in prayer. Gracious God, we pray blessing on these educators, on all who do the hard work of educational leadership. Empower them through struggle and deepen their joy. God, you have called us to be your own to learn from the model of Christ and to learn from our lives with one another. Guide us and direct us, empower us and strengthen us that we may be the people you have created and called us to be. In the name and for the sake of the one who taught us to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would open your Bibles uh, to Mark 8, chapter 8, verses 31 through 36 and 37. What we're about to read is, it comes from the first passion prediction 
uh, from Jesus. It's in the middle of the Gospel of Mark, and uh, Jesus and Peter have just had this conversation where Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here at verse 31, then he says this, he says, then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter And said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross And follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? This is the reading of the Word of God, and God's people did say. You know, every every week I um, write a manuscript, commit it to memory, and then get up on Sunday morning and look it over and stand up and deliver a message. And this morning, as I got here early to the church, I put my manuscript on my desk And was sitting there thinking about today and thinking about the week, thinking about the world we live in. And I wrote these words at the top of my manuscript. And I I bet you'll agree with me. Raise your hand if you agree with me. It's a hard time to be a human being in the world. Amen. Uh, There is so much strife, so much confusion so much pain and it feels like we just keep being pummeled by bad news not just in our own personal lives but in the world around us and then i wrote down these words it's a hard time to live in the world when so many people are so very convinced that they are right about everything agree i really believe that if more people were more concerned about being kind than they were about being right and could suspend the desire to be right, that maybe the world might be a better place. The thing about the teaching of Jesus is that what we just read here in this text is, is he's basically saying we're giving up our need to be right. And I don't think that we need a church. We don't need a church right now that is convinced of their rightness, that is convinced of protecting its rights. We need a church that's willing to give up its rights, a church that's willing to deny itself, a church that's willing to lose itself in the world in order to love the world and to live and love like Jesus. As we're talking right now about the church we need, I think that we need a church that's willing to be uncomfortable. Let me say that one more time. We need a church that says, I love you, you are welcome, we're going to encourage you, come be uncomfortable with us. Because if we're going to address the human sorrow, the human sin, and the suffering in our world, and if the church is going to move from its sanctuaries to embrace people, give up its need to be right, then we're going to have to be willing to be uncomfortable, to have our viewpoints stretched, our values questioned, and we're going to have to repent of our own sin and prejudice and fear and scarcity mentality. Let me ask you a question. 
when was the last time that you were really uncomfortable? Now, I will tell you that I think that airports are the most uncomfortable place in the world, one of the most uncomfortable places. I don't know what it is about airports, but it, every, every time I go to an airport, it's like the most odd human beings are drawn to me like a magnet. I mean, the whole experience from the very beginning is uncomfortable because you have to empty out all the contents of your pockets, you have to take off your belt, uh, you have to take off your shoes, you got to walk through an x-ray device, put your hands up in the air, and occasionally, randomly, you get searched. One time I was traveling, and these things always happen to me. Maybe I'm the problem? But I love to go to the airport and get there a couple hours early because it's a quiet place, supposedly, where you can sit and read. And so I will always look for a secluded spot of the airport where there's a, a terminal where no one is sitting, and there's just a row of seats with no one there. And I will sit down, I will read my Bible, I will take a journal, I will write down my thoughts, and just collect my thoughts. Once I'm traveling, and a lot on my mind, I select this one particular terminal. There is no one anywhere near it. I sit down, I'm reading, and then I see a woman enter my space. And she's sort of circling around me, and I think, surely she's not going to come and sit next to me. And believe it or not, she wa all these empty seats... And she walks in, and she sits down right beside me. Now, I dig my head into the book, and I'm pretending to ignore her. And she starts talking to me. I'm not listening to her. And then finally, she taps me on the shoulder. I'm not, I'm not exact. This really happened. She taps me on the shoulder. I turn to her. She opens up her mouth real big and says, look at my teeth. I said, who what do you say to a stranger who walks into your space and says, look at my teeth? I read this recently on social media. On social media, it says this. It says, uh, uh, a guy was commenting about air travel. He said that modern air travel is a perfectly honed engine of human misery, built to maximize suffering, enhance woes, and guarantee an execrable an execrable descent into madness for everyone taking part in the whole affair. Discomfort, waiting, information withholding, unfair treatments, strip searches, dignity depletion, cramped spaces, rudeness, arcane forms and practices. It's all a beautifully engineered tool of hatred meant to extract money from your misery. <laughs> Another time I go, one last story. These happen all, I go to the airport, I'm in Memphis and I'm sitting in the food court. It's packed with people. A woman walks across the food court with two little boys and says to me, Sir, would you mind escorting my little boys to the bathroom? I can't go into the men's room. I'm like, well, why me? So I, I say, yes, I'll watch your food, she says. So I take these little boys into the bathroom, and it is like total bedlam. They're punching each other. They're throwing water all over each other, and they actually got down on their hands and knees and started crawling under the stalls, surprising some of the occupants. They're running all around the bathroom, and somebody looks at me and says, can't you take control of your sons? And I say, they're not my boys. Really uncomfortable. <laughs> when was the last time you were uncomfortable? I'm not talking about getting squeezed in the middle seat of a flight. I'm not talking about getting in an elevator and going, you know, to the top floor of a building and, you know, um, with someone who hasn't showered in a few days. No, I'm talking about those experiences in life when you were stretched. When you were forced to think of your life in a new way. When something happened to you that pushed you out of your comfort zone. Because you know this, this is true. Growth, new discoveries, always, always require us to be uncomfortable. You can't go someplace new without being uncomfortable. Now, I don't know why this surprises us, because think about it for a minute. That's how your life started. You're in this warm, 
dark spot. You could sleep when you want. You had a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week food source. The next thing you know, you're being pushed through a tunnel. Your arms, legs, limbs are being twisted. They're screaming. There's pain. You get slapped, and you see all these people standing around in green. And then you're now laying on top of the person that, you, that was carrying you. All of life. Which surprises me then. Why is it then that sometimes that we think that what we do here is supposed to be comfortable? Why would we ever get the idea that following Jesus is comfortable? Uh, Maybe that's because we've turned the church into a seeker-oriented institution. Uh, Maybe it's because we have turned the church into a place where it's all about your best life now. Uh, And Jesus did say, I mean, we have it on the outside of our building. It says, come to me, all who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. But nowhere on the outside of our building does it say, come and die. If you want to follow me, deny yourself. You know, it's the old bait and switch. Come get your rest. Come be comfortable. We walk in the church. Hey, what's all this stuff about loving your enemies? What's all this stuff about sharing your resources? What's all this stuff? You mean I've got to volunteer and be a greeter? You mean I've got to go serve the poor? You mean I've got to give up my wealth? I don't know where we get the idea because other than a few statements like that from Jesus, every person he encountered was uncomfortable by his presence. Every one of them. His whole life was uncomfortable. He was a son of God, but he wasn't coddled. He was born in poverty, put in a manger, born in an animal barn. And then remember what happened on his baptism? They didn't take him to lunch and throw a party. God sent him out in the desert where there was no food. And then when temptation came, what was the temptation? The temptation was to be comfortable. The devil came to him and said, hey, Jesus, you know, if you're really God's son, why would God treat you that way? Why don't you make some comfort food and turn these rocks into bread? Which should tell us something. If the primary thing that we hear in, in our Christian life is a message of comfort, It may not be Jesus that's speaking to us. So think about this then. Here's Peter. Peter, his whole life with Jesus is uncomfortable. He's a fisherman. The first thing that happens, he's tired, and Jesus says, let's go fishing. But I've been fishing all day and caught nothing. But if you say so. The next thing that happens... Uh, He says, drop your nets and follow me. Give up your fishing. Giving up your life trade. Everything that happened between Peter and Jesus was really uncomfortable. Remember the time Peter's in the boat and Jesus walks across the wind and the waves and Jesus says, get out of the boat and walk toward me. Talk about being pressed outside your comfort zones. Now here we are. uh, Peter's following, following Jesus Jesus says, who am I? And Jesus, Peter says, you're the Christ. And then he begins to explain to him, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer. And then Peter says, no way, it's not supposed to happen that way. And notice what he says, get behind me, Satan. I'm not here to be comfortable. Then he looks at Peter and he says to Peter, hey, Peter, Peter, If you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. Think how countercultural that is, losing life. Because the American dream is you earn a living and you build your life and move your life toward comfort so that you can retire. The funny thing is, I don't see any place in Scripture where anybody who ever followed God was ever called by God was comfortable at all. You remember Moses? Moses was at midlife when he was called to deliver the people of Israel 
from the Egyptians. Sometime, middle of the desert, he says, hey God, hey God, you know what? This, these people are horrible. I'm ready to retire. And God says, you're right. You've got a good pension coming. Here's your gold watch. Take it easy. Moses served God all the way to the end of his life. And it says at the end of Deuteronomy that he was old, but his eyes were full of life. If you want to be full of life, don't pursue comfort. Pursue adventure. Be stretched. Always be stretched. And so we see this in Peter over and over again. His entire life. His whole story. The church that we need, the life that we need in Christ is the willingness to be uncomfortable. And if, follow, if, if, following Jesus, if following Jesus is comfortable, it may not be Jesus that we're following. The church that we need is a church that says, you are welcomed, you are loved, come be uncomfortable. You know, I, I think the three most difficult jobs in the universe are these three jobs. Superintendent of public schools. Police chief. And general manager of a country club. Former church had all three. The general manager of the country club would walk in every Sunday tired and beat down. Because when you're the general manager of a country club, everybody earns more money than you. And everybody thinks that your whole, your whole life is designed to make their life comfortable. You have 700 members in your country club. Every one of them thinks that you work for them. And you get complaints about everything from the length of the grass to the shape of the green to the food in the grill to the chlorine in the pool. There's a church in Kansas City, fine church called Country Club Christian Church. I think I'd have to rename it. But it fits sometimes. But no matter how much we want the church to be like a country club, it's not. Because we don't get to restrict its membership. You don't get in because you have wealth or you're not restricted. Uh, we don't leave certain people out. And Jesus isn't our general manager. He doesn't serve us. We serve him. What does this mean then for me? It means a lot of things. It means that we've got to be willing to leave behind this bubble that we've created. And we're going to have to become intentionally uncomfortable. There's a lot of bad things happening in the world. There's a lot of strife and a lot of confusion in the world. There's a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. And everybody thinks that they're right. And I think that we have to be willing to suspend our need to be right and, and have conversations. We need to listen to people that have had different experiences than we've had. And we've got to be willing to do that and suspend our judgment and listen and be uncomfortable. Because we can't assume what other people in the world need. And in order to help and be concerned and care for other people in the world, we've got to be willing to be uncomfortable. And we've got to be willing in every area of life to be willing to have Jesus challenge our political viewpoints, our theological orientations, the way we think about the world that we live in. And not only that, we also got to be willing to give up our rights to meet the needs and the concerns of other people. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, uh, we need pastoral care. We need to care for people. We need to be a church that loves and cares for one another. And it's this fine tension of, of we need to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Now, I've got to be honest. I was sitting in the sanctuary this week, and I was kind of whining about all this. Oh, my gosh. You know, we just, we're trying to get things better. And then the Delta variant and Afghanistan, I just, what's Come on, God. And then I remembered Martin Luther in the 1500s pastored a church and led a movement during the, the Black Plague, or during the plague when 60% of the population died. And then this is, this is what I came to. 
sitting there thinking about all this. David, if you wait until the world's in a better place to be the church that you say you want to be or this, that you say you are, you're going to be waiting the rest of your life because it's never going to be any different because we're committed to sinning ourselves to death. So just be who you're supposed to be now and be faithful here. Mask or no mask or delta variant or not. Just be the church. David, just be uncomfortable. Surely Christ's call is an unsettling one. And the paradox of our faith is that we are undergirded in our work and our struggle by the endless love of a God that will sustain us and is committed to do that as we remember in this special and sacred meal. So I invite you this day to celebrate with me the restorative nature of our God. So we remember that he gathered with those he loved. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Eat it and remember me. In a similar manner, he took the cup after supper and giving thanks for it, he passed it among them and said, drink of it all of you for this cup is a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. And as often as you gather... Eat of the bread and drink of the cup, and do so in my name. For these sacred gifts, let us give thanks to God in prayer. Holy God, as we come to this table, help us understand what these emblems truly mean for us. Earlier today, we prayed to you to forgive our debts, and this table represents your forgiveness of those debts. It's a sacrifice we should strive to earn. It's the next request in your prayer that we struggle with as we and, and are uncomfortable with as we forgive our debtors. We pray for strength, the wisdom, and the compassion to forgive our debtors as you have forgiven us and be the church we need. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, it is Christ who is host at this table. All are invited to participate in this sacred meal. As you do so, my prayer is that you come to know the very presence of a God who will suffer with us. Thanks be to that God. Our tendency in our culture is to offer help in the way that makes us most comfortable. Here's what I can do for you. It's a business practice, it's a personal practice. Here's how I can help. What Christ teaches us about generosity is to reverse that question. How can I be of service to you? How can I most offer what you need? Not, here's what I will fix for you, but how can I serve with you? 
How can I offer what is most important to you, to your family, to your growth, to your thriving as a child of God? When we bring our offerings, they are signs and symbols, tangible gifts, our commitment to the work of this church around the world. Part of the reason, though, that when we pass the tray, we share our offerings and our connection cards is that our presence and our prayers, represented on those cards, is also our offering. That is also an act of worship, to bring ourselves before God and to say, how can I be of service to what you need in the world? May all of our gifts be received. Thanks to God for this band of faith, a gathering in Christ's name, that we can push each other in uncomfortable ways to follow the path that Christ has laid before us. It takes that kind of loving accountability, I believe. And I'm grateful for the ways that this congregation has heeded that call to push each other that we might most faithfully serve Christ in the world. If you're looking for a place to join that that call. I would invite you to consider making this a place. We would always welcome you into this space with open hearts and arms. If today that is your choice, I would invite you to stand with me. If you are interested in having more conversations, of course, we're always available for those conversations. But may you know that your invitation to discipleship this day is one to question where those comfort zones have kept you from serving most faithfully. May it be ours to do, to go push ourselves in unsettling ways. But first, let us sing once more of our faith. Will you stand and sing with me? Once 
shall we best serve you? You ask us to leave our comfort zones, to move out into the world and shed ourselves that we might serve others best. How shall we do that without your help? So as we go forth from this place, may we remember the ways that your love was made most fully known and your suffering for us. May it be our call as well as we go forth. In your name. Amen. By His stripes we are healed, by His death we can live, in Jesus' name. 